Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You were the reason why this content remains just so irritating. And today, we are going to discuss locomotives that really, honestly, were quite good overall. Like, there really wasn't anything wrong with them except one thing. There was just one little irritating, annoying constant about them that made them not bad at all. Not even average, like they were still genuinely good, but that one little thing, that one little problem, that one little annoying irritation always drove people nuts. These are five otherwise great trains that had one annoying flaw. The Pennsylvania Railroad Class K4. Oh boy, I'm already starting off with a doozy. K4s are actually a classic archetypical locomotive in railroad history, especially American railroad history. Their 462 Pacifics and 425 were built between 1914 and 1928 by Pennsylvania Railroad's Altoona Works as well as Baldwin. For their time, they were actually exceptional, with a very high top speed of 90 miles per hour, acceptable tractive effort when they were first introduced, more on that later, and they served on the Penzi until the end of steam. Despite being used on the eastern part of the United States, they're actually kind of the archetypical Pacific design. They were so good that they're the ones that influenced Sir Nigel Gresley's Class A1 Pacifics. Much of their boiler design was used in the A1s, which eventually morphed into the A3s. The K4's influence is not to be questioned, and I won't, but they did have one problem that became apparent over time, and admittedly, it really wasn't their fault. It was the railroad's fault. The K4s were good, and continued to be so, but their overall power output was never actually that great, at least not when it came to long freight trains. They were built as the premier passenger hauling steam locomotive, but over time they had to be used on freight trains because they just needed the locomotives for them. That's fine, but their power output wasn't actually good enough to pull the heavy freight trains from the mid-1930s onward. The trains were getting longer and longer, and many of them had to be double or even triple headed. Three K4s had to pull those trains, and it wasn't like the Penzi didn't try to replace them. They attempted it with the K5s, and those were terrible, so that didn't work out. And then by the time they got the T1s ready to go, well, diesels were on the market. So nothing really came about that would replace the K4s until dieselization. As a result, the Penzi actually wasted a lot of money on extra crews because they had to use multiple locomotives to pull their trains. Had they been able to build a larger, more powerful engine that actually functioned as well as a K4, Perhaps that wouldn't have been an issue, and maybe their financial situation would have been better overall. But that never happened, and the K4s struggled along, teaming up to pull the gargantuan freight train of the later 20th century. The Northeastern Railway Class V. The Class Vs were a group of 442 steam locomotives that were designed by Wilson Worstel for the Northeastern Railway. They were express passenger locomotives. In this vein, they were actually quite good. Good top speed, good power, pretty much everything about them was actually really good. Their design was actually strongly influenced by the 442 Great Northern Railway Class C1s. However, despite being built between 1903 and 1904, and then lasting until 1948, they always had one slight issue that only made one person in particular really angry. The firemen. These things loved coal. They adored coal. They consumed coal. They were very hungry locomotives, always demanding more and more coal. Working on them meant that the firemen had to work extra to keep them going. When he did that, they were fine. Like, they worked otherwise. There wasn't any issue beyond that, but they were so coal hungry all the time, constantly needing more and more, more. The V demands more coal. Mr. V, please, I'm exhausted. Give us more coal. The steam demands it. My arms have got numb. Consume. We only know how to consume. 
CONSUME! However, outside of that, the Vs were actually very good. They were only withdrawn because they eventually became obsolete after a while. Sadly, not a single one was preserved. The New York Central Mohawk L1 and L2 line. The Mohawks were 4A2, well, Mohawk type, but they were actually called mountains on other rail lines. For their time, until the end of steam, they were actually extremely good, able to pull long heavy freight trains and even passenger trains on occasion. In the technical sense, all Mohawks, regardless of whether it was an L1, 2, 3, or 4, should have had a top speed of about 80 miles an hour. But the L1s and L2s kinda sort of had a little bit of a problem that actually restricted their speed to only 60. What was it? Well, they were unstable at higher speeds. This was due to the design of their reciprocating gear. It made their four-wheel leading truck better at distributing the locomotive's weight. And that's great and all, but this put the L1s and the L2s at kind of a risk of derailing, which really would have been bad. Like I said, they had to have their speed restricted due to this fault, and it wasn't resolved until the L3s. They and the L4s had the reciprocating gears redone. This eliminated the fault, and they could go at their max speed. Only two Mohawks wound up preserved, because this is New York Central, and scrapping steam locomotives was kind of what they do. 2933 was used as a stationary boiler until a request by the Museum of Transportation in Missouri was granted, and she was sent there. 3001 was actually sold early on to the Texas and Pacific Railroad. They saw fit to preserve her, and now she sits on static display at the National New York Central Railroad Museum in Indiana. The British Rail Class 33. No, I'm not making another joke about this again. We don't have to acacknowledge it. If we don't acknowledge them, they don't exist. It's okay. Just pretend like it's any other locomotive under any other railway. It's fine. Built between 1960 and 1962, these diesel electrics, well, based on that timing, you might think they were really awful, but the 98 Class 33s that were built, they're also known as Cromptons, were actually extremely good. They're so good, in fact, that three of them are still in service now. 24 of them are preserved. They've seen a tremendous amount of fanfare, and they're very popular among rail fans in the UK. I really have nothing bad I could possibly say about them. In terms of performance and reliability, there really were no major problems. They worked great, and continued to do so for many years. Still, now, literally, as we speak. So what was their minor problem? What's the one little thing that was an issue? Well, to be fair, it had nothing to do with their actual inner workings. Like I said, mechanically speaking, they were fine. It was the installation of an ETH, an electric train heating system. This system worked at a DC voltage of 800 volts and at a generator capacity of 235 kilowatts. As a part of their design, they actually weren't given steam heating boilers. They were expected to pull freight, but eventually they wanted to use them on passenger service during the winter. They needed some way to heat. ETH was new at the time, and it had a lot of, uh, things that could go wrong. Things that actually affected the operation of the locomotive sometimes. Electrically speaking, it was actually put together in kind of a weird way. The main traction generator was separate from the heating generator, but they were both built mechanically as part of the same machine. On paper, this was actually great. ETHs are lighter than steam boilers. So this actually allowed the diesel's fuel capacity to be increased from 500 gallons to 800 gallons. That's all well and good, but any time something went wrong on these things, it was electrical, and it was to do with the ETH. They were early designs, and they hadn't quite worked out the kinks yet. This tended to cripple the locomotives at times, when otherwise they would have been alright. It didn't help that they were installed at a time when most of the coaches didn't actually use ETH. They hadn't gotten around to making coaches that used it, so its purpose there really was meaningless. They were preparing for the notion that ETH would become a standard, but it hadn't yet. So they're introducing mechanical problems that otherwise shouldn't have mattered because the ETH wasn't even doing anything! But hey, they worked it out, and otherwise the Class 33s continue to work in service, and are actually very good. The General Electric U30CG. I had to weigh putting the U30CG on this list, because I almost wanted to put it on worst trains ever, 
because its little nagging problem is alarmingly similar to another locomotive used by Amtrak, the EMD SDP40F. And I don't know if I can call it a little nagging problem. The only reason it's little and nagging is that Santa Fe caught it very early before it became a massive issue. And to be fair, in their original form, they're actually all right. The U30CGs are mechanically identical to General Electric's U30Cs. All they really did was give them car bodies and a wide cab. The purpose of this was that Santa Fe found that they really liked the U30Cs, but they didn't look like passenger locomotives. And at the time, this was in 1967 when these were being produced, they still ran passenger trains and wanted them to look aesthetically like passenger trains. So General Electric created the U30CG. Mechanically, they were absolutely fine, and worked really well, and they could pull passenger trains, but they were equipped with a steam generator for heating the coaches. Because of course they were. If you paid attention and been watching me for a while, you know exactly where this is going. On February 9, 1969, one of these things derailed while hauling the Grand Canyon Limited on Edelstein Hill near Chillicothe, Illinois. The investigation that followed tested the locomotive itself, and found that the design may have been the reason, having nothing to do with the tracks or anything else. Santa Fe did not screw around with the idea of a derailing situation, and they were immediately pulled from that role and placed on freight assignments and had their steam generators removed. Since they were originally built from the U-30Cs, which were freight units, they were absolutely fine in that role and served until 1980. But it's just another lesson that we always need to take the physics of water into account whenever you're designing anything. Water's pretty heavy, and uh, when it sloshes, it can make an interesting motion that sometimes locomotives can't account for. Fortunately, this never resulted in anything catastrophic here, although sadly the U-30CGs did not actually survive into preservation. All six of them were scrapped by 1981, which is unfortunate because I think otherwise they are beautiful looking diesels absolutely phenomenal design in terms of aesthetics. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hawk 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dimeblade 17, and Anzac A1. Till next time. This is Darkness, and we dwell a fond farewell.